、えー、それではお待たせいたしました、えー、MIT のコンピュータサイエンスの准教授それから米国の国防総省 DARPA のロボット工学および神経形態学的システムのプログラムマネージャー等を歴任されまして現在トヨタリサーチインスティットの最高経営責任者を務めておられますギル・プラット博士からカーボンニュートラルと自動車というふうに題しましてご講演をいただきたいと思いますそれではプラット博士よろしくお願いいたします Thank you very very much and good afternoon everyone and thank you for the opportunity to be with you today I would like to discuss with you my own perspective both as a foreigner who sees Japan from the outside and as a scientist who works for a Japanese company from the inside of what Japan can teach the G7 and the world about how to most effectively address climate change. From my perspective, Japan as an island nation has accumulated very significant and unique experience about how to thrive despite limited natural resources. I believe it's no accident that lean manufacturing, including the Toyota production system, was invented in Japan. Japan's innovations in minimizing waste and raising quality in manufacturing have been an incredible gift to the world. Today, I believe that Japan can teach the G7 and the world how to apply this same lesson in an even more important way to reduce carbon as much as possible as soon as possible, despite limited resources. It is actually the same lesson that is necessary to survive in a lifeboat. If we were all in a lifeboat, like this one on the screen, which is from Sir Ernest Shackleton's extraordinary journey to Antarctica, would we give all of the fresh water to one person so that they could wash their hands, or would we distribute the water more widely to prevent thirst? I hope the answer is obvious. If we were on this lifeboat, would we give everyone the same amount of drinking water, regardless of their needs, or would we give more water to those who are rowing? I hope the answer to that question is obvious also. Now today, in the fight against climate change, lithium, as well as many other battery minerals, are just like the fresh water in the lifeboat. It takes up to six times more critical minerals to build a battery electric vehicle than a conventional car. And while it takes two to three years to build a battery factory, it takes between 10 and 15 years to build a new mine. As a result, even though there is plenty of battery materials in the earth, many experts, including the International Energy Agency, predict a shortage of 30 to 50% for the next 10 to 20 years which is roughly the lifetime of a car. And it is not just lithium that will be in short supply. There will be shortages across a wide variety of critical materials and huge geographic diversity in charging infrastructure. So even if the battery material shortages subside, renewable charging infrastructure will be in short supply in many parts of the world for decades to come. Now, carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere for a very long time. Removing carbon dioxide directly from the atmosphere requires tremendous amounts of energy. So what we emit today will remain in the atmosphere for our great-grandchildren and beyond. Therefore, we must reduce carbon emissions as much as possible, as soon as possible, even during the coming decades of resource constraints. In other words, not only are we in a lifeboat with limited resources, time is also not our friend. If we want to succeed, we must work hard, row forward, and make progress as much as possible as soon as possible. And we must not waste resources. So let's look at this in the context of electrifying vehicles. Consider this picture of 100 existing cars that emit 253 grams per kilometer averaged over their lifetime. And let's say that we have 100 kilowatt hours of batteries that are available, kind of like the fresh water on a lifeboat. We can choose to put all of those batteries in a single long range BEV, like giving all the fresh water to one person on the lifeboat to wash their hands. That one customer will do well 
but because their car's average lifetime emission will be only 62 grams per kilometer of CO2. But the total CO2 emission of the 100 cars will decrease only slightly because only one existing car will have been replaced. Now, alternatively, we can choose to distribute the same battery capacity to six PHEVs, even though the average lifetime emission of each PHEV is 80 grams per kilometer, because we are replacing six conventional vehicles, not one, the average emissions for the whole fleet is reduced more. And those PHEVs are also more affordable, which means customers are more likely to buy them. We can even choose to distribute the same battery resources to 90 HEVs that are even more affordable. Even though the individual carbon reduction is less for each one of them, the average emissions reduction is much greater. This somewhat non-intuitive result is insensitive to the exact emission figures for each vehicle type, because the average reduction is far more affected by the number of vehicles that are replaced. Now, of course, this does not mean that we should only make HEVs. The world will have battery resources in excess of an HEV-only solution, but it will not have enough resources for a BEV-only solution. Now, here's a second way to look at it from the perspective of economics. In the chart that you see in front of you, we look at a metric we call carbon return on lithium, CROL which is simply the grams of prevented CO2 emissions divided by the grams of lithium invested. Now, what does this chart tell us? It says that the initial small amount of battery that we use to electrify a car is what does the most good. Adding more battery past that amount has diminishing returns. Now, this is because the average car only drives a modest distance every day. So carrying around unused battery capacity that could be better used in another car is a form of muda, analogous to the muda of excess inventory or the waste of water to wash hands on a lifeboat. The points that are on this chart actually group themselves together into BEVs, PHEVs, and HEVs, with the HEV having the highest carbon return on lithium. And this chart is for average US power generation. If we want to change the geography from the US to Switzerland, what you see is that because Switzerland has one-tenth of the carbon emissions per kilowatt hour, BEVs get even better. But so do PHEVs, though not as much. In other words, BEVs have more benefit when there is renewable electrical power and easy access to recharging infrastructure. But other electrified vehicles still reduce more carbon per gram of lithium. Now, if we move to Wyoming, you see that in this beautiful state with mostly fossil fuel electrical power, the largest BEVs actually have negative carbon return on lithium compared to ICEs, and in fact, can't even be plotted on the chart. Now, again, this is not an argument that we should only make BEVs. We have enough resources to make many BEVs, but we do not have enough resources to make only BEVs. So like giving more water to the rowers in a lifeboat that are rowing, we should allocate BEVs to where they will do the most good for customers with easy access to low carbon intensity charging. To achieve the most good overall, customers in other circumstances, like passengers on the lifeboat, should consume fewer resources and replace their conventional vehicles, not with BEVs, but with PHEVs and HEVs. Here's a third way to understand this intuitively. This is a study of a battery factory layout in Japan. It contains two plants labeled number one and two for HEV batteries, and a third plant for BEV batteries. Each of the two HEV plants will be able to produce 210,000 vehicles per year worth of batteries. But the BEV plant, despite being many times larger and consuming 10 times as much power, only produce batteries for 80,000 vehicles per year. So BEVs make sense for some customers in some parts of the world, but they are a waste of resources for other customers in other parts of the world. 
So I'd like to conclude by talking about Amara's Law, which I know that you discussed in a previous meeting here. Roy Amara was a famous American scientist who said that people tend to overestimate the speed of technological change in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. But is Amara's Law actually true? The picture that you see here is often used as a counter example. It shows traffic on the same street in New York City, city separated only by 13 years. The short period of transition from horses to cars on this one street seems to defy Amara's law. But is this the whole story? Well, actually, the picture I just showed you is deceptive. It turns out that across the whole US, not just one street in New York, it took 50 years, not 13 years, for horses to be replaced by cars. And it took even longer than 50 years globally. So Amara's law, it turns out, was still true, even for the replacement of horses by cars. In the same way that infrastructure limitations slowed the time for cars to replace horses globally, shortages of battery materials and global disparities in renewable charging infrastructure will slow the adoption of BEVs. The lesson that the G7 and the world can learn from Japan is that despite these constraints, it is still possible to achieve carbon neutrality on time. The key is to minimize muda and to use resources where they will do the most good. I recently saw many leaders at Davos speak about these issues, and their comments are heartening. Business leaders and even the media see the challenges that are before us and are beginning to agree with our approach. And COP28 will further this trend to move from aspirational to actual innovations. Now is the time to keep our foot on the accelerator. We must continue to share our point of view and educate governments, business leaders, and the media about what we know is true. Carbon is the enemy, not a particular powertrain. Providing customers a diversity of choices for electrified vehicles will give everyone, regardless of geographic or economic circumstances, a way to contribute to carbon reduction. And it will also result in the most total carbon reduction despite battery material shortages and the gradual deployment of renewable charging infrastructure. Like a giant wave, climate change threatens to overwhelm the world. More than any other nation, Japan knows not only how to survive, but how to thrive despite resource constraints. I urge all of you to be inspired by the courage, the skill, and most importantly, the perseverance of the rowers that you see in this picture. And hold firm in helping the world understand what Japan knows best. Thank you. I think it's very important to understand uh, that diversity is actually a uh, form of efficiency, but not the usual one. Uh, it is easy if the world is changing slowly uh, to get the most efficiency by optimizing one solution. And every day we make it better and better and better and better. But the natural world teaches us that this does create one very efficient kind of life form, but it also creates a, a kind of brittleness, a sensitivity to disaster. Because if the environment changes, the animal or the plant that became so specialized uh, does not uh, have the ability to adapt to the change. And so it's necessary to understand that diversity is also important, mm. not only efficiency. And so what I would say is kind of a way to educate people is to look at nature as an example. Uh, there is not only one kind of tree in the world. There are different trees for different climates. There is not only one kind of animal, different animals for different climates. And each of them has a different role to play. And if the earth suddenly changes, as has happened in history, for instance, when a meteor struck the earth and killed the dinosaurs, Almost all kinds of life on Earth were killed, but still many others survived. Because as we say, the answer to uncertainty is diversity. 
And the truth about the future is that we don't know how to predict it very well. We can predict a few years in advance, but not many. And so many things will change. The climate will change, geopolitics will change, material supply will change, the supply chain will change. And so my advice is to help people to understand that diversity is a necessary strength and to allocate some resources for diversity and other resources for efficiency. I hope that's helpful. I think it's very important that we help the public to understand that uh, e-fuels and biofuels, uh, in general low carbon synthetic fuels, uh, are likely to be a viable option uh, for at least a significant fraction of industry. Uh, this includes uh, aircraft where there's actually very little choice but to use some kind of synthetic fuel or perhaps hydrogen. Uh, and I think it may also apply for automobiles and also for other kinds of uh, transportation that uses internal combustion engine. Uh, the number of uh, vehicles that exists in the world right now, it will take a long time to replace them even under the most optimistic circumstance. So the desire to find a solution with low carbon liquid chemical fuels is very high. And I think it's very important if our real goal is to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, not simply to have a one size fits all answer. So I think that trying to help the public understand the promise of low carbon fuels is a way to help them to understand this. Uh, it's important to understand the argument that some people use against low carbon fuels. They often will speak about low efficiency in the process of making the fuel, but there's actually a way to counter that argument, which is to explain that efficiency is not the issue, cost is the issue, total system cost. And so for instance, if you look at photosynthesis, the production of energy in plants uh, that all of us eat and sustains all life on earth, that is only a few percent efficient. And actually the production of low carbon fuels is more efficient than the production of energy in plants. So uh, it may not be the most efficient option, but I think it's an extremely important option uh, for helping to achieve carbon neutrality. The other final thing that I'll say is that time is on our side. Uh, if we are genuinely concerned about carbon dioxide emissions, in another few years, it will become obvious to everyone in the world that there is not enough battery materials to use a battery only solution. There's not enough charging infrastructure, infrastructure from renewable resources to charge all of those vehicles that way, and we will need other paths. So the goal is to help the world understand it before it becomes obvious in another five or 10 years. I hope that's helpful. Maybe I'll start by uh, saying something obvious. Uh, I am very tall and uh, like two meters. And so it is difficult for me to buy clothes. Obviously, not everyone in the world should wear my size of clothes because then many people would be unhappy because my clothes will not fit everyone. In the same way, we don't have to have the same solution for all parts of the world and for every industry. With regard to geographic diversity, um, as was uh, said by uh, Mitsubishi, uh, I could not agree more. I think this is exactly right. Um, I think that uh, Akio-san has pointed out there are many parts of the world with no electricity. Well, they will not be recharging their BEVs anytime soon. Uh, that's okay. We don't need to have the same answer everywhere. I think many people would not look good wearing the same size clothes that I wear. Thank you. 